Okay, so, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we can go on with the next talk. So, please welcome on stage Konstantinos Leimonis. He's a coffee and motorbike lover. He has Cuba dived uh, with sharks, but overall an everyday engineer. He hasn't provided with uh, any other fun facts, so I will read an academic definition. Leimonis is a genus of lichen-forming fungi in the family Pilocarpaceae. It has two species. The genus was circumscribed by Le lichenologist Richard C. Harris in 2009. You learned something, okay? <laughs> anyway, he is here to talk about micro front ends, so please enjoy his talk. Ciao, Verona. Do you hear me all right? Yeah? Okay, cool. Uh, always interesting to learn new things about uh, that your surname is actually Fungi. That's, that's something interesting to learn about. But I'm not here for that today. Um, uh, I'm Konstantinos. I'm a software engineer based in London. And uh, I'm actually Greco in heart because I'm coming from Athens. Uh, this is the place I've been raised. Uh, so, uh, the topic I would like to present you today is about how to keep sane uh, with React and micro frontends in production. This is more like how you can apply observability in production with React and micro frontends. Uh, so, to start with, a quick agenda for today. We're going to see about, we'll talk about a production issue, uh, talk a bit about what are micro frontends, the observability, and finally, we're going to see a demo how we can apply those two in a real world, more or less, kind of case. Uh, and some goals of this talk. Uh, so, we're going to define what is observability for micro frontends, how we can apply that. We are going to see some useful patterns, how we can actually apply that in a React uh, micro frontend application. And finally, we're going to learn about how we can um, start using that by getting alerted and also automate, automate this process. So, first of all, a, a production incident. This is totally a hypothetical case. So, you actually, uh, you, you're, it's, it's your weekend, you're actually spending some time in the sun, uh, by the beach or in the park. You know, I love, I love sun as much as you do. And basically, you get a call from a, a, from a colleague in the support team, and they tell you, okay, we have some users that are signed in and they're getting kicked out from the app. Ouch. This is not a great experience. Uh, this is really bad experience for the user. Imagine having users actually paying for this service and this product, and you're actually getting this behavior. This is absolutely really bad. And they're like, like this. They're actually sweating, and they're actually panicking. They're really anxious and stressing. And, but I mean, we are developers. We have used to this kind of situations. We can actually deal with that. Uh, so we'll try to calm them down let them breathe, breathe in, breathe out. We try to help them actually go through this situation. And we're start, starting debugging this kind of incident. So we'll go through some attempts. So first attempt is going to be, we're going to start like uh, trying to reproduce this issue in production. So we, we're, we'll start asking this uh, colleague, what are some, some more details? Uh, what is the country? What are the pages? What is the feature? The only thing that this support colleague knows is that this issue is happening in Italy, but he has nothing more to say. Uh, he, he's panicking about uh, uh, people calling them, telling them right uh, that this, this issue is happening on and on, but he has mo no more details. So what we're doing, we're going to emulate the user. We're going to go through some uh, critical flows that most of the users will follow, and we will actually try to to reproduce this issue in production. So first attempt is we're going to connect to a VPN or a similar tool to in order to be able to uh, emulate our region to be in Italy. And then after testing a bit, going through these critical flows and everything like that, you get this error. And you're like, minified React error number 168. What this is about? We're going to go, you g and you're going to say, I mean, Thank you, React. I mean, this is not what I was expecting from you. I, I would like a more declarative error to understand a bit what is going on over there. And if you go to the documentation of React, you will understand that, 
okay, they are actually minifying all these error all these errors in production so as to be more performant over the network, which is fine. But even the um, description over there doesn't help much. And now we're going to start with attempt number two, which is going to be source maps. So we're lucky enough, and we have the source maps in production, which is good. So we say, OK, we're going to use them in order to, order to reproduce this issue and find the root of the cause. What is the root in the, in the code base? But we are using the mi micro front ends. We're in a micro front end uh, application. So we have a cell and host that are bundled separately. So you don't have the source maps actually um, that that uh, that actually can reference the hosted apps. So and we're like, okay, what we're gonna do now? I mean, w source maps are not working, production is not working. We have one last attempt. This attempt is going to be about we're gonna try to reproduce the issue that we managed to reproduce in production, but in localhost. Uh, we're going to get checked out in the production version, okay, in our local machine, and we're going to go through the same flows. Now the, the React is, go is not going to be minified, so we're going to see the full error of it. And after testing a bit, we're able to reproduce it, we are uh, fixing the issue, we are releasing to production, and then we, are able to we were able to uh, fix that issue in production. So, well done. Can we spend a minute to actually clap for this kind of developer that actually managed to resolve this issue? Yeah, yeah. We've been all these kind of heroes that solving this kind of issues in production in the past, uh, these kind of developers. But are we happy with this kind of approach? Is this like something deterministic? No. Why? Because this is th there's entropy. There's a lot, of, a lot of randomness in this kind of process. So you're basically quite lucky that you were able to reproduce the issue in production and you were also able to reproduce the issue locally. This is a very happy path of debugging that kind of issue in production. But we're developers and we're not happy with this approach, so still we are keep asking ourselves what if this issue is not happening for all of our users. This issue is not easy to reproduce for these kind of users because it might be an edge case or might be a special kind of environment variable that is not specified for, for our user. Uh, and most importantly, how is our users going to, exp we don't understand how our users are going to be experience our application. So we don't know what errors are they getting, how often are they getting these errors, is these errors happening only for users in Italy or is this also uh, other places as well is there any other app, uh, parts of the application that you're getting these errors? All these questions, you cannot actually answer them without observability, and we're going to see how we can do that. One of the problems here is the micro frontends. Okay, that was wrong. Okay, so micro frontends is basically like an adoption of the microservices in the frontend world. So we're trying to split up the frontend monolith to separate small bundles uh, of, of applications. And we're able to scale the team uh, in, in a way, bo scale both the team and the, uh, and the code base in a way that you're going to see like your, your code base getting bigger and bigger and your team is getting bigger and bigger as well. But the most important bit is that you're able to uh, define a team that is end-to-end -end and can actually focus on a specific business domain. Uh, that business doma domain can be really specific and this team has a mission this mission can be, for example, for team discovery to help customers discover new content. And in some cases, though, if we zoom in in, in one of these micro frontends, uh, you the the case might not be that straightforward. So you might have a micro frontend that is um, is uh, including like a header and footer that is a team A responsible for. But we have the account details, which is another micro frontend, that it's another team, team B, that is responsible about. And yeah, definitely micro frontends is not for everything. It's not a solution, it's not a silver bullet. But when you actually have a, a problem like scaling your team and scaling your software, it's definitely a really good choice to, to think about. But the most important bit is that all the micro frontends need to follow the same principles. But for now on, I want us to focus on 
micro front ends as high observable systems. Um, and this is how we're going to define observability. Observability can be a quite generic, uh, um, abstract uh, um, definition. But the thing is that we can, we can try to limit it down with some abduction. So observability is not monitoring. And when we say about monitoring, is basically when we have uh, uh, some monitoring tools where we can actually see how a system is behaving. But in order to do that, we need to know and uh, know beforehand how our system is behaving. And uh, so, for example, we need to know what metrics we need to count. So, for example, we need to measure, like for example, the RAM usage, the CPU usage, or anything like that. But monitoring has been the, the de facto way for quite a long time. But we d we didn't have the opportunity to uh, help us understand and answer all these open-ended questions that we saw earlier on. Uh, on top of that, observability is not intuition. Uh, so as we saw earlier in this production incident, you might have a really, I mean, se um, senior member of your team that is responsible uh, for the project and might have a quite a long of experience, a uh, long time of experience in this project and can use this experience in order to be able to identify, isolate, and uh, uh, actually resolve the issue in the production. But observability is here in order for us to democratize this kind of process. It's basically a way to give all the team members the opportunity to find out these bugs in production and try to resolve them uh, in a considerable like, small time. The most important bit about observability is that it will help us know our users. And the way that it's going to do that is by uh, defining high cardinality data. So it's really important to know how our users are using our application. And high cardinality data can help us do that. When we say cardinality, this is more like um, uh, we know how many that there is a set of values uh, that you can define in, in a given set. And the, the, the more high frequency of this kind of uh, values, the, the more the values that we, can that we can get in this set, we can actually get a higher cardinality. For example, you might have a user ID, which is able to identify me and you as a user. And this is able to uh, identify what, where this issue might be rooting and might be uh, happening. Uh, so user ID is, for example, a, such a use case. Now, let's see how we can combine observability and micro front ends in such uh, a way that we can actually get something out of it. So, uh, can you still see my screen? Okay, great. Um, let me so, I have prepared the demo. Uh, as you can see here, so it's. Uh, Okay, uh, so uh, this is a basic, uh, a really simple application. This is going to be a microphone application where you can see a cell, which is the my account. Uh, you can see at the top is the cell application of different micro front ends. Uh, we have the micro front end of header, the micro front end of footer, and the micro front end of profile. Header and footer are quite dummy um, uh, micro front ends, uh, basically rendering a single component, uh, as you can see. But the profile is a bit uh, like uh, more uh, complicated. We can actually fetch uh, characters from uh, Rick and Morty API. And for example, here, as you can see, I'm able to fetch the profile of d many different characters. The way that I have set this application is basically using Lint.js. Lint.js is basically uh, a tool, an open source tool that uh, is able to help you um, uh, set up a new micro front end application or migrate the monolith that you already have in the front end to, to, uh, to micro front ends. Um, so we, we, you can see that here we are defining uh, is basically an abstraction on top of Turbo Repo. And you can define some, um, uh, s some uh, packages, like for example, here some workspaces where the app is the apps folder is basically where your cell applications can live. Uh, here you can see inside the cell, uh, we have 
a simple Next.js uh, application that is the shell application for the rest of the uh, micro frontends. And here in the index, you can see that we are using the host. Host is uh, like a component that is coming from Lin uh, Next, uh, Lin.js. And you can use it in order to define uh, some micro frontends that are going to be loading in the runtime. Uh, this is an, abstra an abstraction on top of uh, module federation that Webpack 5 uh, started providing. And that way you can actually reference to the package names um, for in order to be loaded in the runtime. Uh, here in the micro frontends folder, you can find some more micro frontends, like for example, the header, the footer, and the profile. And on top of that, we are able to define the packages, which is some shared logic, uh, like for example, some uh, React state, some runtime uh, logic. Uh, we also have some UI components uh, here that we are able to share among uh, the shell applications and the micro frontends. And uh, finally, some util logic, some, some, some utilities. Um, so as you can see here, uh, in this application, we have some buttons on the right, like for example, the header and the profile footer. And these, these buttons are able to trigger an error. So for example, here, a component error is actually breaking the whole app, which is a real bad experience. We're able to reset it, but I mean, it's, it's, it's really bad experience. So basically, what we need to start with is basically creating some boundaries around this, uh, uh, these micro frontends, so as not to have these errors uh, affecting the cell application. Uh, so what we can start with, we can basically go here in, a in our micro frontends, and for the header, for the header component, for example, I have prepared here um, a wrapper component, which is um, wrapping the header component with an error boundary pass to this error boundary component the name of the component, the package name, and the package version that we read from the package JSON file. And we are able to, let's export it uh, as header. And let's do the same thing for the rest of our micro frontends. So for example, here in the footer, we can, oops, we can export um, the boundary as footer. And same thing for the profile uh, component. Um, so now, if we reload our application, now if we trigger these errors, basically all the errors are contained inside this uh, micro front in this micro front end, so we we don't affect anymore the cell application, which is great. I mean, this is the fir very first step. Uh, so yeah, b basically all of these are able to. Uh, to catch this error in this in this kind of of scope, um, by using this error boundary, uh, we can basically track uh, these errors in inside the component did catch for React errors and uh, JavaScript errors, and here you can ex uh, actually pass the that is erroring. Uh, and you can also define some high cardinality data, as we saw earlier, which is package name, the package version, the component source, which is the name of the component that we were passing to the error boundary component earlier on. And we need to define the error types. So here, we, are, we need to define some, some different kind of errors. And what we can see is that basically, we need to uh, categorize the errors in three different types. So we have the React and JavaScript errors that we're going to catch with the React error boundaries. We have the async errors, which unfortunately we need like to catch them separately. And finally, we have some UI error models that uh, we need to, it's a good practice actually to get to know uh, that uh, we uh, show them to the user uh, in order to be able to identify that, that, uh, that this error might be affecting the user uh, experience as well. Uh, so if I go back, we can we, we mentioned that the error boundary here we're able to track this error and finally we can also try to um, catch these async errors so if i go to the profile component you can basically see that here in the catch block uh, when we are fetching uh, the characters from the rick and morty mpi in the catch block we are able to track these errors in the same way that we did for the error boundaries 
uh, and you, you are pa we are passing the package name, the package version, the component source, the error type, and the user ID. The user ID is one of the most important ones because we are able to identify uh, that these errors are coming are happening for specific users. And finally, we also need to um, here we are having some error models. So if I reset my application, uh, we're able to see that for some reason we, for example, uh, some we we want to display an error to the user, so we have some display errors over here, or for example fetch a character and there is an error with an API and we're getting like uh, a 404 or any such kind of uh, error status code. We can basically show this error uh, model to the user. And we needed to also uh, track this kind of uh, um, UI interaction with uh, to, the to our service. Um, here, uh, in the error model, basically, we are able to, uh, on the component mount of this error model, we can actually track uh, this, this specific action with some metadata. And if we want to be more specific, this metadata are actually something similar to what we've seen with error boundaries and async errors, uh, which is going to be the package name, the package version, the component source, and also, also the user ID that we're handling over here. So in that case, uh, I'm using New Relic for this integration. Uh, so as you can see, we can actually emulate that uh, the notice error is basically a console log in order to start getting these errors in the console instead. And when I'm triggering an error, uh, we can see that this error is happening. And what we're tracking to the New Relic service is basically what we've seen earlier, that the component source that we started this error is header, the component stack, the error type, the package name, the package version, and the user ID. And we can we are doing the same for we are doing the same for the error character uh, when an API error, for example, occurs. But you can see that here we are triggering it twice. Once is for the actual error that we're getting from the API, and once for the model that we're actually displaying. And for this model, we are tracking similar data uh, as you can see to the um, error boundary and the async errors. So now that we have all this data and we're tracking this data to New Relic, what we can do is we can basically go to New Relic and start using this data in order to uh, see what are the errors that we're getting and how many errors are we getting and everything like that. So going to New Relic, uh, you can basically, I assume you can do basically the same thing with any other tools like uh, um, Sentry or Datadog or anything like that. Uh, but here with New Relic, uh, you can actually uh, select the JavaScript errors from uh, yeah from JavaScript errors where uh, the app name equals the micro observability, which is the application that we're actually using. And here you can see that we're starting getting some these kind of errors that are happening in the app. And we can even like go further deep, like defining the error type that we just defined. Uh, that is can that can be either an error boundary or is a, or an async error, and that way we can limit down the number of errors, and you can even like count the amount of errors that are happening, and you can even define the period that these errors have been happening, like for example since one week ago, and you can see that how many errors are we getting, and finally we can also get a time series of it and have a graph about how many uh, errors are happening during this time. Uh, we can do the same thing with the page action, which is a different table uh, specifically for uh, in New Relic. Uh, and here you can define, uh, instead of the um, error type, you can define the action name, which is um, the error model display. And we can start querying all this data that we have started tracking before in the application. So this is the first step. So we, we have this kind of queries that we can use, but we don't have a good way yet to use them. So we can query this data. We have the data available in our tracking system and all this stuff. But actually, how are we going to, to use them in action? Uh, how are we get gonna get notified? Um, so the way that we can use is basically we can use Terraform for that purpose. Um, Terraform is basically, I mean, um, 
uh, a way that you can actually define a YAML way, uh, some infrastructure. And uh, here you can define some providers. Like for example, here you define the new Relic provider. And here you, you can start defining an application uh, like this. And also uh, resources about the, the new Relic alert policies in order to start getting alerted in the application. Um, if something goes above a, b a specific threshold. Uh, so for example, here we need to define also the alert conditions. And this alert conditions is basically the queries that we previously saw in the new Relic application. So basically we can start counting all the number of errors that are happening for this app name and the, and the specific package name, like for example, the profile application. And we can define also the thresholds that we're interested in. Uh, now we're going to define just two errors in order to be able to uh, define uh, more, more components. Uh, to, to in order to be able to get more, to less, less, uh, more errors and get notified more uh, with uh, these alert conditions. And we're also able to define the same thing for the paid actions and the app name uh, for micro observability with the app name, the er error model displayed. And finally, we can see how we can actually uh, um, create this uh, and push it to production. So what we can do, uh, we can cd to Terraform, and we can actually initialize uh, Terraform here in this, uh, in this path. And then we're going to see how we're going to apply. Oops, let me Terraform, Terraform apply. So we're going to see how we're going to apply these changes. Uh, so here, Terraform will notify us that what are the changes that we're going to bring as part of these infrastructure changes. Uh, so here notifies us about that we're going to create a new alert channel, which is the email that we're going to get alerted to. Uh, here is the alert policies that we have set and the alert conditions that we're interested in based on the queries that we have set before. And after deploying that, we can say yes. And now we have deployed this, this kind of integration with Terraform in production. And if we go back to New Relic, uh, here in the alerts and AI, yeah, you can see some new alert condition that has been created. And these alerts contain the, the conditions that we've just created. After triggering too many, if we start triggering too many errors in the application and we start, start getting so many errors in the application, you can see that we can basically uh, get alerted for this kind of queries that we have actually set. Um, so we're going to get uh, a, a, a notification in the email like this one that will tell us that there is an error uh, in, this, in this kind of query. The, the um, the conditions that you have set have grown a lot, so you're getting notified. And this is a good way to start like understanding more and more how our users are actually experiencing our applications. And the way that we can set it is through uh, New Relic alerts uh, or any other system that we've been using. Uh, if you want to learn more about uh, how we can actually deploy infrastructure as code uh, in TypeScript, uh, this is a really good talk of Dennis that has given earlier on. Look, uh, I will post the slides afterwards. I mean, you can find them also in uh, in the application that uh, the team has shared. Uh, and uh, I think that was all, mostly to sum up now. Uh, what we've seen is basically that observability can be hardened some, sometimes. Uh, it, can, it, can be, it might not be that straightforward how we can implement. The most important bit is that we need to start creating scopes and catch the errors in this kind of scopes so as uh, we can identify the errors and uh, mitigate on, on the specific level of its, of its micro front end. Uh, we need to, to start tracking the errors uh, like we did uh, in this case and also uh, automate the alerting so as to get notified when something goes really, really bad uh, and uh, we're aware that uh, something really bad happens in production. I think that was all. Uh, that is
me. If you have any questions, feel free, I mean, either to share here with the team uh, or uh, find me afterwards after the talk. And yeah, this is my Twitter handle if you want to share uh, or if you want to reach me out. And grazie mille. Uh, any questions for ah. Constantinos? Okay, now it's working. Okay, yeah. Any questions? No questions, but I have a couple of questions for you. Okay, okay. Um, is there any way to automate the monitoring and alerting? Yeah, I mean, we, we can do that with Terraform, of course, uh, like we've seen in this example, uh, but we you can also do that, for example, with TypeScript. Uh, if you want to create some infrastructure as a code, uh, you can, there, there are quite many modules that you can use uh, with TypeScript and you can actually automate the process of getting alerted. Uh, there are quite many SDKs with uh, quite many uh, known like um, providers like New Relic, Datadog, uh, Sentry or any, I mean you, you can even use for example uh, OpenTelemetry uh, if, you, if you're interested into. Yeah, so there are quite many options there. Okay, thank you. Um, what about error not tracked from the error boundaries? The error not tracked for yeah, from, from the error the boundaries. Yeah. yeah, I mean, you you need basically you need to this kind of errors you need to track them separately, either in the try catch block or, for example, if this is an async error, uh, like we've seen, you need like to have like a to to track them specifically in a catch block. So you need to track them separately. You need to, to catch them and track them separately outside of the React error boundaries. Okay. And uh, how would you handle async error tracking for requests or other processes? Yeah, I mean the uh, async errors can be, can be hard. I mean, the, the easiest part is, for example, when we're actually uh, triggering a request to an external API. Uh, so in that case, in the catch block, you can basically uh, cuts these errors and you can track them like we've seen in this in this uh, example. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Thank you. Uh, last chance to <laughs> ask any questions to Constantinos. No. Okay. No. Thank you. No. Okay. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.